Welcome everyone. We will begin in about one minute, so please hang tight. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending our Wild Woman Expedition webinar on the Antarctic. Tonight, uh, we will be joined with uh, Franny Bergschneider and our special guest, uh, Rocky Kapila from Cork. Franny, if you could switch to the next slide. Let's, we're gonna show a quick video first to start us all off. Julia, your sound isn't coming through. You're on mute, Julia. Julia, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so I will start again. <laughs> so tonight we are joined by Franny Berg Snyder, Global Program and Operations Manager from Wild Women Expeditions, and Rocky Kapila, our Senior Polar Travel Advisor from Cork Expeditions. So if you have any questions as we go through the presentation, please put them in the Q&A box, and we will answer them as we go if we are on topic. Otherwise, we will save all the questions for the end during our question and answer period. And if we don't get to any questions, we will definitely email you back. So please feel free to make sure you put those questions in there. So to start off, I'll hand it over to Franny. Hello, everyone. I am Franny Bergschneider, and um, I work for Wild Women Expeditions as the program manager. Um, I am also the Wild Women Expeditions uh, polar specialist, and I have um, about eight years of experience working in Antarctica and the Arctic, and I've been on approximately... 80 or so voyages to the Antarctic. Uh, and I'll be traveling with Wild Women Expeditions in January, and we're going to the Falkland Islands, South Georgia, and Antarctica for our first voyage. And at this time, I just like would like to um, say a land acknowledgement. I'm based in Toronto, Canada, and so I'll be acknowledging the land here. We acknowledge the land known as Toronto. We honor the present. We honor the past, present, and future of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee, 
that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers, have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. While we're on the um, vein of land, I just wanted to pop up a visual of the, the Antarctic continent just here. Uh, it's a great visual, I think, because we often spend much time looking at a, a map um, and it's it's quite amazing to look at it from the bottom of the bottom of the world um, and see what it looks like. And we can note that you'll see you'll see on this this slide that you can just see the tip of Argentina just on the left side there, and uh, the body of water between the Antarctic Peninsula and Argentina is of course what we know the Drake Passage. And the portion of Antarctica that we'll be speaking to today is just, just the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, that's where we go. And uh, when we talk about the places that we visit, we'll be speaking to that area, as well as the Falkland Islands in South Georgia. So why Antarctica? Why go to Antarctica? Um, you might be thinking, Gosh, golly, why go there? It's so far away. Well, fret not. I'm going to walk you through a couple of slides and uh, tell you a little bit about some reasons or a little bit, a few reasons why um, we love to travel there. Antarctica is a continent dedic dedicated to peace, science, and wilderness. There's no indigenous population there. There are a few bases. So this 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 loans or this leads to a feeling of um, being in a no man's land. You you really are very far removed from society. You're in an untouched wilderness. In this untouched, remote, pristine wilderness, you can't get to these places any other way than by ship. You can see here, so this is the, a place called the Lemaire Channel. Looking down the little ch the channel there, you can notice that it's quite narrow and often we'll sail through it and it's, it's actually only eight cable widths wide. There's much wildlife in Antarctica. The biodiversity, biodiversity there is, is extreme. And what's very special about Antarctica is that there's no terrestrial predators there. So like the Galapagos Islands, if you've traveled there, there's no terrestrial predators. And what this means is the wildlife is unfazed by your presence. And so we have some, some guidelines about how close you can get, um, but you can still get, for example, within uh, three meters of penguins. And of course, this, you can see this woman is, is within, um, the distance of those other penguins likely they've they've waddled up to her and uh because what we know is we follow the rules but the animals they don't have to you can get quite close and have very intimate experiences with animals that are unfazed by our presence perhaps one like this this is a chin strap penguin. We can look at this photo and we'll notice that the landscape here is just unlike anywhere else we've been on the earth. It's sort of like a moonscape. It's a glaciated landscape. The sun, the sun is shining almost all day long. It might get a little bit dusky around midnight um, but it's almost 24 hours sunlight when we go there. We'll be there in the austral summer. And you can notice that when you look at this land, you'll see that it's all crevassed and glaciated. And a huge reason is to visit Antarctica is to go and visit or look at the ice. Here's another photo of a glaciated landscape. You can really see how that those 
glaciers cover the mountains. We'll also see some icebergs. You can see here's a group of folks. Actually, that's me driving a Zodiac on a, on a Zodiac cruise here. And it's quite remarkable when you're taking photos of ice like this. So I'm actually very, very far away from this, but it's it's the perspective that you can you can get in with cameras that loans to this vi visual. We actually don't get that close in real life. In the, in the picture, it looks like I'm close up, but I'm actually far away. But you'll you can view these stunning, stunning icebergs and all the different um, shapes that they take. You will also have access to see sea ice. And I have a little video here I'll play of the ship going through some sea ice. It's a time lapse, so it's it's a, a little bit choppy, but it's meant to it's meant to show an accelerated time. So another reason to go is on a ship is you can go on, you can see many different places and experience many different things. And then at the end of the day, always come back to the safety of the ship. You don't have to unpack your bags and you can move into your cabin. Ship acts as a floating home, which really allows you to kind of relax into the moment and really unfold into the process of the experience. All your needs are taken care of here. You may start to feel uncomfortable because it's a new experience. And the challenge here is to surrender into the unknown because the experience here is fully catered. All of the meals are provided for. All the Zodiac cruises will be guided for you, the landings. You'll just need to surrender to the present moment and listen to the announcements. This is a photo of me knitting, actually. <laughs> so it's at a penguin colony called Coverville Island, one of the largest Gentoo penguin colonies on the Antarctic Peninsula. And I love this photo because it really, it really represents, I think, it really represents taking a step away from reality and just immersing yourself in the presence of the place. You can really disconnect. There's no internet. Well, actually there is internet on the ship, but you have to pay for it and it's not very reliable. <laughs> um, and we really recommend and encourage you to disconnect from all technology, pause and take time for reflection. And then you'll, and then um, as, you, and as you disconnect, you'll be able to find presence in the peace and really immerse yourself so that you can you can experience um, you can experience events such as this one. This was on a Zodiac cruise. I think in the Aurora Channel, we we happened to find a pod of killer whales or orca. And they were super curious, these orca, and they came over and they would swim under our zodiacs this day. A really beautiful experience and again there's lots of marine mammals in the ocean down there and it's um it's an adult scavenger hunt being open and curious and getting out and seeing what every day getting out and seeing what you can find it's like um the ultimate adult scavenger hunt or 
an Easter egg hunt. These, this is a, quite a common uh, encounter that we'll have down there as well. Lots and lots of humpback whales. And so why wild, why wild women expeditions? Uh, well, in a, in a very simple way, I think what we do is we create safe spaces for women to take up space and shine. And we want to really gather in community and experience the wilderness of Antarctica and uh, experience it together. Um, and we've 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 specifically partnered ourselves with Cork Expeditions. They're a leader in polar ex, ex, expeditions. And they have female expedition staff. Um, we've secured berths on a on a small ship with 128 passengers, and that means we're a smaller group within a larger group. Uh, and so what that means is when you're on board, what you'll also uh, receive by booking through Wild Women Expeditions is a Wild Women host. And so that's kind of like your personal concierge, someone who will be eating meals with you and um, will be stationed at a specific spot in the lounge that you can meet with after or before presentations or and the daily recap and briefing. And you will have exclusive Zodiac cruises available for you, as well as, as exclusive onboard programming. And one thing that we're super excited about is that we'll be heading down to Antarctica where 100 years ago, women weren't even allowed to go to. And so we're keen to to continue carving out space there um, for us to take up, up space and shine and really, really continue to explore the feeling that anything is possible in a landscape that was previously dominated by men. It's very important for us to return. And on that note, I'll hand it over to Rocky to share some of her experiences in Antarctica. I have to say, I, I'm so calmed right now. It just feels like a really nice yoga slash meditation class happening in Antarctica with Wild Women Expeditions. Um, and I might just uh, break the silence because I'm not a very quiet person, so I apologize if anyone was in a nice, calm, relaxed mood. Um, Antarctica for me uh, was actually not on my radar, a place that people that, at least people from my family or my um, the community that I belong to, wasn't a very spoken of area or an area that you would say is a place that you'd wanna go and travel to. And I don't know if any of you have experienced this, but uh, I definitely have not just experienced it on my personal life, but even when I'm on calls with people, it's a very common theme when people say like Antarctica, why would you want to go there? That's crazy. Um, well, welcome to the group of crazies because this is the right side of crazy and uh, it's a great place to be. Um, Antarctica is one of those destinations that there are very few destinations in this, in this world or on this planet, I would say that you just need to experience for yourself. Um, all these pictures, you know, they, they speak, they give you a little bit of a story, but they don't give you the experience. And that experience comes when you actually go on to these expeditions. The, and I, and I often say, this is like, this is a trip you book, but it's, it's a journey that your senses will experience. You know, you just, it's something you feel. Um, and I feel it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a, a, a journey for the soul. When I first was being sent to Antarctica. I was definitely told, oh, once in a lifetime trip. And it was like, who doesn't want a life once in a lifetime trip? And I was ready to embark on this journey, but I'm a, I'm a, a single female. I didn't know if I was going to like how everything was going to work out. I'm going to get there. Will anyone even speak to me? Or if somebody does speak to me, like, what will I say to them? You know, do I fit in at all? 
And um, within five minutes of being on the ship, completely forgot I was by myself because it seems that there are a lot of people who travel solo to Antarctica, whether by choice or um, because their partners are like me, cannot find family members who would really want to join them on this adventure. And in a sense, I'm very thankful for that because I got to just get outside of my own comfort zone in so many different ways. And I got to not just explore Antarctica, but Antarctica had me exploring myself. Um, and it had me pushing uh, boundaries and, and things that I never would have even imagined to that whole, I am this person, I am that person no longer existed. I was just, I am is what it came down to. And um, taking chances, being in a very supportive group of people um, with, with fellow, with women, as well as men, like it's a very different uh, type of clientele. It's a, a like-minded individuals, less than 200 passengers on these, on these trips, all encouraging you to just take that one step forward. And when I went, uh, the first thing I smelt was whiff of penguin. And I was just like, whoa, that's, that's intense. Um, and then it was the same thing that we were all like, oh my God, I could bottle this up. This is happiness. At the end of the trip, we just, it was like the fragrance um, of choice. But what really, really did it for me more than anything else were the icebergs. Like I did not know that there was a side of me that was into rock formations or geology. And all of a sudden it just opened up this whole new area of, of adventure. And I was um, telling Franny and, and Julia that um, it's amazing how this trip, because it's a combination of the expedition team members are extremely enthusiastic and very, their, their passion is contagious and it's, it's felt and it's experienced again. They educate you on what, on, on board. And then when you get off the ship, you're actually, you're, you're going through, you're seeing everything that was spoken of, whether it's the history, the geology, the glaciology, the history, the marine biology, there's the ability to identify different species of penguins, um, of seals, whales, like it was, it was extremely interactive and very, very educational. But what that did for me was it changed the way I looked at travel altogether. And so I have frequently gone to India a few times. All of a sudden, India looked different because now the mountains and just this, the culture and so many different things, it got me more invested in the places that I'm traveling to and learning about, whether it's the people, whether it's the wildlife, whether it's the mountains, whether it's the type of, of trees that we're looking at or the type of rock formations and that was all thanks to that first trip and I've been a huge addict to polar travel since and I've been with Quark Expeditions now for 10 years. In the 10 years I've had the opportunity of not just working with sales and being a part of so many customer journeys but also working on the ship um, alongside this amazing expedition staff um, which for a person who is well, for an Indian Indian woman, I have not would never imagine that that would be a place or that would even be an option for me to consider as a career. And um, I joined Quark in 2012 and I didn't have not worked for Quark since 2013 because now I actually know what it feels like to, to do what you love. And I get to speak to people because I always don't have an audience at home. So I get to talk to people on the on the phones and tell them about all these amazing experiences, both to the Arctic and Antarctica. And um, people, I've actually sailed with Franny and Franny was absolutely instrumental in, in that energy of feeling contagious, like just contagious and so full of life with some of the expeditions that we're seeing. And it's amazing to me to this day that you see those places, you think people are bored, but when you're going, and even though you've been on countless um, expeditions to some of the same destinations, it still feels brand new. And there's only few people that has has like few places that have that type of magic for all types of people. I can go on, but I'm sure nobody wants to hear me extend myself. Um, so thank you for listening. Thank you, Rocky. That was lovely. Thank you for sharing. I'll just change the slide and we'll talk a little bit about the Ocean Adventure, a ship that both Rocky and I have been on together for a few voyages. 
And uh, as we mentioned, there are 100, 128 guests max, so still a small ship feel uh, for an expedition in, in Antarctica. It is our floating home, um, and our floating home and community. And it is where we'll have our all of our meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we'll carve out space. There'll be a space carved out for uh, wild women meetings to occur. And we'll eat our meals together here on board. And we'll disembark the Zodiac together. You can see where we will disembark, where those humans in yellow jackets are walking up the gangway there. I don't know if you not you guys know this, but the sea, the, before the ocean adventure was the ocean adventure, it was called the sea adventurer. And um, this was where the ladies driving team of Antarctica first began. Uh, so you'll be, you'll be joining that ship should you book with us uh, for next season and uh, live in the dream with the ladies driving team. <laughs> And I just wanted to show you a few photos of what the ship will look like and some of the um, rooms there. So the top right is a cabin and you can see it's a cabin with a porthole and a twin shared cabin. Uh, super, super basic. And the bathroom was actually recently renovated about five years ago. And um, they're quite nice. They have heated towel racks. And um, you can see the lounge just below the cabin there on the right. And it's a nice place where we gather before dinner every evening for recap and briefing. And you can see this lovely calm lady on the left there. She's uh, enjoying the outer deck space. And what we love about this ship is it's a real true expedition ship, an expedition sea rate, um, ice rated vessel. And it's designed as a house or a home, we should say. It's designed as a home. And so you would treat your cabin as you would treat your bedroom. And uh, you really move into the ship. You, you live in the areas and you lounge in the areas um, that are for eating or resting, and you just really utilize the outer deck space as much as possible. You don't end up spending heaps of time in your cabin. If I could just add also like the, um, when you're looking at the, the ocean adventure is an extremely, like it gives, it leaves you with a very intimate feel, but it also one of the most authentic feels of exploration in the polar regions. Cause this built, this ship was, uh, built for expeditions. So uh, it was later converted for passenger use and it has that nautical feel to it. So that appreciation of how explorers used to travel, you know, um, and now still with the comfort of, of the beautiful cabins and, and the ship. So it really gives you that authentic, you know, stepping into that explorer's kind of shoes and, and going out, but with, with a lot more comfort and the luxury of, you know, um, tools that help us navigate and get to places and back. So it is a, it's probably one of the best ships and a ship that I think, Franny, you'd agree a lot of the expedition staff, as well as a lot of our passengers who've sailed on this particular ship do tend to come back to because they love it. They, they love the feel of the ship. It's, it's very different. Yeah, I would agree. Thanks, Rocky. And I, we wanted to speak to um, um, the types of excursions that we'll have. So when we leave the vessel together, uh, we'll, we can go on different types of excursions. One type of excursion might be a landing, which would be um, landing at a landing on the land in and in and around Antarctica, and the feature might be a glacier or a penguin colony or at the bottom left, you can see that's Deception Island. Uh, so the old whaling base there. Or you might, we might land at a current base. So for example, there's a place called Port Lockroy. You might've heard of it. It's a British museum and they have a gift shop and post office. And a few other countries have many more bases as well. Uh, there's also a different type of excursion we could go on, which is a Zodiac cruise. And here we are out and about in a boat, 
cruising uh, iceberg. And you can see that there's some penguins on the ice in the distance as well. And we'll be seeing many, many different types of animals out on these excursions, uh, not just on the excursions, on from the ship, from the platform of the ship as well. Um, seabirds such as penguins and albatross and and also large marine mammals such as this, the, the crab eater seal in the bottom left there and the elephant seals in the top middle, as well as larger marine mammals such as humpback whales or um, it's not uncommon to see orca as well. We also have an exceptional onboard program on on uh, on the ship and each ship the ship will have um lecturers such as marine biologists ornithologists historian a historian glaciologists geologists and um they've they've curated and cultivated presentations to be able to speak about what we're seeing so that it's um it's mirrored with with uh, what we're seeing out on the land and learning. And the lecturers actually, they actually come outside with us as well. So uh, they'll be out and about, you can, they're very approachable and accessible. Uh, and they'll be teaching not only on the ship, but also outside on the excursions as well. And then there's also the expedition team. The lecturers are of course, a part of the expedition team, but um, overall the expedition team just as Rocky said, she spoke to it so well. It's just a, such a contagious energy and um, really world-class experts in various different fields. Um, this is one year um, when we were landing at South Georgia where we got all dressed up in our dry suits to catch Zodiacs um, in the surf zone. So we really wanna make these, all the landings possible and uh, have fun and uh, spread joy. And here's another expedition team photo. We'd also like to talk about some adventure options. And here's Rocky. She joined the kayaking program here on a voyage. I think this was on a voyage that we were on together on the South Georgia Falkland Islands voyage. And uh, did you want to share any kayaking stories, Rocky? Actually, so this kayaking, this, the fact that I've, we've got this picture is like, it's a pretty big deal because when I first, before, when I first went to Antarctica, like I would never have stepped into a canoe or a kayak um I had such a fear there was no way it was happening and then when I went to Antarctica in 2013 I was learning um about the kayaking program and every day people would come up to me and be like well if this was the only time we could ever go out it was well worth it this I would pay the price any day for this and it's like but I doubt it's going to get any better and every single day they would have this glow and this happiness um, and then their pictures would tell a different story altogether. But all of them, like it was just, it was incredible. And then I got to go out into the Zodiac uh, just to observe how the kayaking program worked. And it was, it was so stunning and amazing that I ended up coming back to Toronto and I ended up enrolling in a kayaking program, um, faced my fears, did a wet exit, did everything. And I cannot believe what, like kayaking is amazing. If I had not faced those fears, I would have been missing out on something so magical and so beautiful um, in different parts. Like I've now kayaked in, uh, in different parts of the Arctic with even with beluga whales um, in Toronto and different, in different places, you know, that I travel to. And I now also um, motivate people like especially from my family to do like from young girls to different circles like different groups of friends and we've all gone out kayaking so it's it's been remarkable it's been remarkable I mean I cannot say enough it's it's really that life-changing trip definitely for me stands true it changed my life in many in many ways amazing 
So great. I love that you were able to share that with your family too. Oh, absolutely. I still encourage it. It's just the, I get a little ticked off if they start taking my uh, nieces and, and all on kayaking trips and say, like, that was my thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, but so great to see you in this kayak. And as Rocky was sharing, this is this is one of the sea kayaks and that's part of the sea kayaking program. So if you did choose to um, enroll in that program, it's available by request. And uh, it's you have access uh, throughout the whole voyage uh, to the in, to the kayaking program. So anytime that kayaking, they can kayak, they will, and you can opt in to kayak, or you can say, nope, I'm I'm not going kayaking today, um, but I'll see you next time. And then there's another type of kayaking that we have, and it's it's um, the paddling excursion. Exactly. Thank you, Rocky. Yeah, the paddling <laughs> excursion program. And it's a one time, it's a one time experience and cost. And we use these, these uh, blow up sit on top kayaks. And so you can, you can do it one time and you have access to kayak. And exactly as Rocky was sharing, it's such a unique, special way to be able to experience the nature, like the natural habitat of the place, you can really rest and be silent and experience the place without human noise, which is quite special. We also have a camping program, which will only be available on one of the itineraries we have in, um, at the end of 2023, beginning of 2024, and that is the, the peninsula trip. So the um, Antarctic Explorer discovering the seventh continent, and that's on December 2nd to 12th. So if you were really keen to camp in Antarctica, that would be an itinerary for you. And it's just, it's a quick experience. I think you, you go out on the land around nine o'clock, set up uh, your bivy sack here, put your sleeping bag into the bivy sack and you're on top of some thermoras and then you settle in for the night and you you sleep or not sleep and experience Antarctica and all that has to offer so the sounds of the ice it's just magical this is also a polar plunge experience and there's also a polar plunge experience on every voyage. And this is actually Rocky's polar plunge. Did you want now to keep in this? mind the expedition yeah. team members are not kicking me in. It's all a part of it's all being a staged at this point. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I volunteered to jump in. I don't know why I did it, but I'm glad I did it. At the same time, I had no choice. <laughs> I was uh, bullied into it from... Uh, <laughs> fellow passengers who were in their 60s and 70s who said that I did not have an option to say no. <laughs> and they already took pictures of me as one of the people who was going to be doing the polar jump. So I had no choice. I had to jump. And it was great. Amazing. With the polar plunge, I always think it's better to regret going than to regret not going. Yeah, I, I 100%. Yeah. So it's awesome. That's amazing. What a fun time it looks like. I've been a few times myself and I love it. It's amazing how it, when you hit that cold water, your nervous system goes crazy and all your instincts say, get out. But the moat, like if you can just take a pause and say, relax and fight your instincts, you're safe in this cold water. It's very I, powerful. I think it's, uh, it's also, you know, why we have uh, such youthful glowing faces as well, right? Yeah. The polar plunge. <laughs> the polar plunge. Amazing. And uh, this photo here is, it looks a little choppy and it's, it's prompting me to mention, start talking about seasickness. So I think probably a question that has been on your minds. And um, if we don't cover everything on this slide, feel free to pop more questions in the, in the Q and A box. But uh, we just wanted to touch on seasickness and the Drake Passage. Um, so the Drake Passage is a body of water that's notorious for storms. 
Um, and it can be, the crossing can be Drake Shake or Drake Lake. It's just luck of the draw. I send you Drake Lake vibes on your voyages for sure. Um, saying that, if you happen to get seasick or you normally get seasick, we, we really recommend talking to your doctor before you go and they can perhaps write you some prescriptions that go along with your particular body chemistry and needs. And it's it's great to note that there is an emergency doctor on every voyage. So there's somebody stationed on the first night that you that you arrive and they're set up to talk about seasickness and they have uh, a seasickness clinic. Um, if you do get really ill, they'll come to your cabin and be able to help you as well. So fret not. Um, it will be, it will be, it will be great. It will be Drake Lake for you. <laughs> Across hey, one of the questions along the same lines is, <clears throat> excuse me, is, is there anything that we can do to prepare for the Drake Passage? That's a great question. So the Drake Passage is quite like, if it is lumpy, it's the ship is rocking. And so one thing that's great to do is to actually build up your core strength uh, because life on a ship is, is uh, more manageable, the fitter you are. So if you can practice yoga, that would, be, that's great for balance and core strength. Um, and then I mean, it's the thing is about, you can't really do anything else to, you can't do anything to prepare for seasickness. It just either hits you or it doesn't. Um, and I, yeah, if you don't mind me jumping in, um, okay. some of the things that you can do. So the expedition team members, the EL is going to be the expedition leader, sorry, will be, um, advising us of the type of weather we might be faced with. Um, I have found crossing the Drake passage that the anticipation of the Drake Passage is far more fearful than the actual Drake Passage. Sometimes I'm surprised that we've already gotten through so much and it's like, oh, okay, so I thought it was gonna be rougher or it turns out to be a great story. But one of some of the things that one could do when you're on the ship is one of the things is make sure if you are taking motion sickness medication that you take it with dinner. Um, it's really good to have it at that stage. Maybe on this day, it's good to um, prevent, like, you know, avoid drinking uh, alcohol, or if you are having maybe a small amount, it would be good. Drink lots of water, um, eat lighter versus having something heavier. Um, so just eat light, uh, carry some from some fruit. You can also, so on the expeditions, you know, um, coffee, tea, hot chocolate, and um, soda, uh, soft drinks, there's going to be uh, provided for. So if you want to let your uh, let somebody know that you would like some ginger ale, I found that ginger ale or ginger candy also helps. And then lying down helps as well. And the great thing with the ocean adventure is that if you were not feeling well while there was a lecture happening, um, what I discovered on the ship was that I could listen to the lecture while still lying down on the bed if I wasn't feeling too good. So it allows you to stay connected to what's happening, but also rest if that's what you need. And sometimes if you just need to sleep, just sleep. You know, this is the time that you, you know, just concentrate, work on your, like, you know, just focus on what you need. Um, and if you want something light to eat, just have some, some fruit. Uh, when you feel good, try to get some fresh air wherever there's an opportunity. Those are small little things that might be able to help you out. Um, but yeah, the anticipation definitely is, is a bit more scarier than the actual passage itself. And how long does it take to get through the Drake Passage? Uh, generally anywhere from a day and a half to two days, depending on. The, so if you get as Franny, we're all wishing for the Drake Lake, um, it can be pretty smooth to get through and lots of great opportunity to go out outdoor, be out on the outer decks and do a few things. But um, yeah, it generally is a day and a half to two days, but sometimes it's, yeah, probably it could be short. Are there any other seasickness questions, Julia? Great. Thank you, Rocky. That was so informative. Tried and tested. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
this yeah um and now we'll take some time to talk about the wild woman antarctica trips that we have so we have three different itineraries rocky did you want to speak about the um each itinerary yeah um so we have the three the three different types of itinerary so it it's all going to come to what your personal preferences are um the three of them that have the three itineraries that have been chosen are some of the most popular most desired trips so if you can do something if you if budget and time allows you to travel for 20 days and you feel that this is your once in a lifetime and there's like i want to ex- i want the best wildlife expedition that there can be you know uh then the mecca of wild of wildlife is going to be doing the 20 day trip where you go to Falklands, South Georgia, and then the peninsula. A lot of people sometimes feel like, okay, what's there to do in Falklands? I don't care for Falklands that much. But um, what I was surprised to experience was there's that Falklands to get is such a rich destination in terms of um, the landscape and the wildlife. And also like there's, there's a number of different islands that are owned by, by people. Um, and then there's one town Stanley. I was absolutely stunned by, so one of the pictures that you're seeing is the albatross colony. So one of the largest albatross colonies that you can go and see. Um, but the terrain, like it was one, at one point I thought I was somewhere in the hills of Scotland. And then I'm, as I'm walking through, I see these beautiful hills and then these cliffs. And then I'm walking a little further. I'm seeing penguins on one side, sheep on the other side. And then, and then all of a sudden there's this white sandy beach with so now I'm thinking I'm in the Caribbean and I uh, I'm kind of lost as like what is going on, um, so it's not your seasickness medication it's actually the the destination. But the best part is this is where you can see the rock hopper penguins. So you're going walking on the beach. You go towards a the corner. There's a cave of these rock hopper penguins. Very cool. Um, but as you keep going to different places, something special. There's something so special about Falklands. And then when you go to South Georgia, uh, my funny way of explaining South Georgia wildlife experience versus peninsula is imagine going to the mall during the weekend, that's the peninsula. Imagine going to the mall during the weekend during the holiday season, that's South Georgia. The volume and 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 Franny will speak to this with a lot more detail um, in terms of what you, the volume of, of wildlife that you get to see. But if this is something you know, um, being able to experience it all, and you know that you may not be able to go back, then the 20 days is what I recommend. If you want to experience South Georgia and the peninsula, because a lot of people, the truth is that when they've been to Antarctica, will come back and say, ah, I wish I, I went to South Georgia as well. That's why we have a 16-day program that allows people to travel to South Georgia and the peninsula, and is concentrated on those, those two areas. And then, of course, if you are looking for, you know, a true Antarctic experience in terms of just looking to go to the different points along the peninsula uh, for Antarctica, then you can do the the 11 day program with discovering the seventh continent. So there is something for everyone, depending on what it is that you're kind of looking for. Regardless of what you choose, you're coming, you're going to come back with an Antarctic glow. That's, that's one thing that will happen. Amazing. Thank you, Rocky. And I'll, I'll go through some slides here just to show you a little bit more about the wildlife from each place. So this is a photo from uh, the Falkland Islands, and it's a very, it's a, the largest black browed colony, the largest black browed, black browed albatross colony in the world. Try saying that 10 times fast, <laughs> Rocky. <laughs> um, and it's just, this is just a magic place. The, the, the vibrations on Stanley, um, excuse me, on the Falkland Islands are very, very peaceful. And this is partly why there's a lar- large colony of the albatross there. You can see them flying, soaring, dynamic soaring, and coming into land on their robust nest. They're like sitting on eggs at this time of the year. And you can see this long grass that Rocky was talking about just blowing in the wind. It's really a different place altogether. 
And then we'll move on to South Georgia. And so this is an elephant seal pup, or as we like to call them, wieners here in South Georgia. And if you choose to travel to South Georgia in November, December, th these guys are just littered on the beach. And they're so curious. This, this, this pup had come up to me to try and chew on my backpack. And yeah, he's like sleeping in some nice down there. But really, really cute. And they make these hilarious noises. Just, just be prepared for your heart. Okay, your heart might not be able to take so much there's, oh, there's it was so like much. you thought the penguins were the highlight and then you see the wieners and you're it's like oh my god that's it I can rest here for the rest of my life now I'm done <laughs> so true oh my goodness and this is a place called St. Andrews Bay and it's the largest colony of king penguins in the world uh, there's about 600,000 king penguins here on this beach and uh you can just see from this photo how beautiful they are there that they have that classic uh, contoured contoured um, shading so white belly black back but then they also have that beautiful orange crest uh, just on their neck and on their head and that's a king penguin and uh, I'll show you some more pictures here of the king penguins and a little bit more zoomed out you can see on the bottom right there those those fluffy ones they're not actually a different species but they're the the chicks of the king penguins um, and as we as we go along here you'll see that the chicks are crushed together so they're they're grouped together they do that at a certain point in their development stage when the parents will go out to get more uh, fish and food to feed they need more sustenance and they'll group together for safety but what ends up happening here is you can see that these like these natural striations in the penguin colony you can see the brown lines and then you see the um the black and white groups and those are the the chicks and crushed together and then the adult penguins in between so zooming out even further you can see this is the colony where there's 600,000 king penguins here at St. Andrews Bay. And the Jenny, gorgeous really landscape. Good, sorry, is there a good time to see uh, these penguins? What time of year is best? That's a great question. So these this type of penguin is available all year. So on our two itineraries that we have, we, we go to South Georgia once at the end of November and once in February. And you'll be able to see the king penguins both times of year. They have an 18, 18 month cycle. And so there, there's always penguins, king penguins in South Georgia. Um, but this is it zoomed out and you can just really see those natural patterns, the brown uh, versus the, the white and black, it's just it's super amazing. They say that you can see this from space. <laughs> I'm not too sure about that, but a girl can wish. <laughs> and uh, don't forget to put yourself in the photo as well. <laughs> and we Sorry, want before you move to that, um, there was a question that I, if you don't mind, I was going to answer. In terms of, there was a question that was asked about um, if the experience would, the Antarctic experience would be different. Um, so if you look at Falk for the Antarctica versus like if you were doing a 20 day, think of Falkland, South Georgia and Antarctica being their own specific individual journeys that are being, you're just adding it together. So with Antarctica, if you want more time in Antarctica than um, the 20 day, or I would say go for the 11 day, those are two really, really good options. If, if you're, if, what you want is to go to Antarctica, then, you know, doing a 20 or the 11 day would be a good one because it's concentrated, you know, on having enough time in Antarctica as well. Hope that answers that question. Sorry. Yeah. And so we'll spend, uh, we wanted to speak to the pre and post travel recommendations. And uh, if you have time and, um, the budget for it, then adding on a few days in Buenos Aires to get your city fix could be a great, a great place to go. Um, you can 
drink sample the Argentinian wines and try the Argentinian steak. It's world class. Um, and then spending a few days in Ushuaia could be a great time as well. Uh, my mom and brother joined me on a trip in Antarctica in 2018, and we rented a little cabin in Ushuaia, and we we spent some time hiking in the mountains. And my brother went out and got two king crabs and brought them back to our cabin, and we had a king crab cook off. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's lots to do in Ushuaia, and if you have time on the way home, you could also make a stop in Patagonia or the Guasu Falls, but that's extending your voyage quite significantly. Um, but some things to consider as well. What to pack? Oh my gosh. Um, you don't, truthfully, you don't need that much because you end up wearing the same things over and over and over again. But I would say the most important piece of equipment uh, you bring is a, is a pair of binoculars. I would recommend eight by 42, but the best pair of binoculars are the pair that you have. So if you already have a pair and it's not that, that's perfectly fine. Um, and it's it really is the thing to bring. It will enhance your experience probably by 80%. Super, super recommended. Uh, a waterproof backpack. Uh, you saw the photo that we showed for seasickness. It's just the weather can be quite uh, sporty, shall we say at times. And uh, with uh, some, you might have a, be a beach landing. And so we really, really, really do recommend a waterproof backpack, especially if you have pieces of equipment like a camera. It's definitely super important to wear, bring, uh, to wear face sunscreen and even apply it multiple times a day um, before you, after breakfast and after lunch is a great idea. The sun is so super bright there, 20 hours a day, and uh, the glare off the snow just hits you in ways that it never has before. Sunglasses, also for the same reasons, to protect you from the glare and the sun. And it's a great idea to bring multiple pairs of waterproof gloves or mittens and a hat and a neck warmer. And the way we pack our clothes for this trip is unique in the turn in the sense that we want to pack based on layering. So when we go out and about in a zodiac, we're going to be wearing base a base layer. So maybe a merino wool top and long underwear, and then you're going to put on your fleece pants over top to give you that insulation, protect you from the cold. You'll have um, like a sweater or a fleece. You can have a wool sweater or a, a fleece. And then over top of that, you'll have your waterproof pants and uh, we'll actually give you a expedition parka that you can take home with you. And the parka is waterproof and it also has an insulation layer in it as well. In terms of when you're on the ship, you'll want to have casual, comfortable, comfortable clothes for that. And uh, we recommend bringing one nicer outfit for the captain's welcome cocktails and uh, the farewell party as well with the farewell dinner. Um, we recommend bringing extra batteries for your camera as they drain quite quickly at the cold. And if you have seasickness medicine that you prefer, it's best to bring that as well as your own universal adapter. Yeah. Brandy, just a couple of questions on the packing. Um, and about the parkas, can the one question is, are the parkas provided to come home with us um, or are they on loan? They are provided for you to keep for the rest of your life. And uh, as we mentioned, they're waterproof and they also have a insulation layer that you can zip, zip um, out or keep in. So you could opt to have it a little bit. If it was a little bit of a warmer day, you could zip the insulation out uh, and you can zip it back in. But for you to take home with you. If you don't want to take it home with you, you can donate it on the ship and leave it there. Perfect. Another question about the waterproof backpack or the dry bag. Do you have a size that you would recommend that uh, they can take for um, any expeditions like on the Zodiac or on shore? Yeah, I think my waterproof, I just have a, like a dry bag waterproof backpack and I'm pretty sure it's about 30, 30 to 35 liters. Um, you're not packing for a multi-night trip. You're just, it's just 
to keep your camera and all your layers dry. Um, and if in your binoculars, um, an extra set of mitts, an extra hat, that, that kind of thing. And can you talk about boots, footwear? Oh, great question. Yes. Uh, there will be a pair of expedition muck boots distributed to you right at the beginning of your voyage that you will have on loan for the duration of the voyage. And they'll be collected at the end of the voyage. And when you're on board, you could just wear regular walking shoes. We just say that not to um, have any open toe shoes um, or any flip flops. So it is, as long as it's just because some of the areas can be wet, so you don't want to slip and fall. So just, you know, just I find regular walking shoes that you would take during travels is is good. Flip flops are OK as long as you're using them within your cabin. Um, but outside, just casual. So you don't really have to bring too many shoes unless you want to. Heels so definitely don't not required. So they don't need to bring additional hiking winter boots. No. No hiking boots needed. You'll just have Expedition Arctic Muck Boots. Yeah. And they're, they're the Muck brand. They have a very thick rubber sole. So they're very insulated. And uh, they go up to just under your knee. Well, I guess, depending on how tall you are, I'm 5'8", and they go up to just under my knee, and um, it's neoprene. So they, we find that those work really well to keep you dry and keep you warm while you're outside. Yeah, and I'll, are there any more question, packing questions, Julia? Um, no, but more questions, so uh, we will move forward. <laughs> All right, here's our oh, question. Okay. question time. <laughs> okay, um, we've got quite a few questions coming through. So I know we're cognizant of time. So let's hopefully we can motor through some of these. Um, what is the temperature day and night? What is the temperature day and night? That's a great question. So we, we, we will be visiting Antarctica in the austral summer. And uh, it, it doesn't, it's going to be between zero and 10 in South Georgia, it might be above that. And there, there is the odd day where it's above 10. It might go up to 15 on the peninsula. Um, however, when we're out and about on the zodiacs for, let's say, two hours, it can feel like it's colder than zero. So you want to always be prepared uh, to de-layer and relayer, as we say, uh, because the, the weather is inclement. It changes. It's very dynamic. Perfect. Um, and what is the best time of year to go? The best time of year? Well, it just depends. Well, that's such a great question. It's so hard to answer. Uh, the best time of year to go is when you have the time to go. And if you have all the time available, then something to think about is what your priority is and what you want to, what you want to see. So if you want to see ice, for example, icebergs, any time of the year is a great time to see icebergs. If you really want to see whales, you want to go down and see feeding behavior of humpback whales. Perhaps February is a good time of month to go. If you want, if you're particularly interested in penguin behavior and um, you want to see, I mean, you could just look at what's happening over the course of the season. Uh, in December, there'll be sitting on eggs and their chicks will be hatching in January. There'll be new, very young chicks. They'll grow over the month of January. And in February, they will be pretty adult looking, very fluffy adolescent chicks. And in March, they um, will be well on like at the end of the development stage. So adolescent, fully adolescent, fluffy, losing their chick fluff penguins. Um, Rocky, do you have anything to add to that question? No, I would agree. I mean, it is so during the time that one can travel for, you know, for, for tourism or to be able to um, experience Antarctica is during the austral summer. And it's during that period of October to 
March. Anytime that you choose to travel within this time, you're going to have, you, you'll come back with an, an amazing experience. So when it comes to when's the best time to travel, it always is dependent on, it depends on what it is that you want to experience. So if you want to see, as Franny said, like the penguin chicks hatching, or if you want to see the more pristine conditions, then November, if you were going to say Falkland, South Georgia, if you were considering that trip and you wanted to see the wieners or the, this, you know, the, the elephant seal pups, then November. So it, um, whales, the, and the feeding whales, then you want to go in February. So it all comes down to the best time to travel is what, based on what you're looking to experience, you will determine when it is the best time. If you're open and you just want to experience Antarctica, then honestly, you can choose any expedition during that, that season. Awesome. Thank you. Um, another question is, how do you work around the 100 people shore, ashore regulation um, with the ship? Oh, great question. Yeah, so uh, because this is a smaller ship, what, what could happen is, um, it, what will happen is they'll be split in two. And so half, half the ship will disembark. They'll go ashore. And then the other half will disembark and they'll go Zodiac cruising. They'll participate in their respective activities for the duration of time allowed by the expedition leader, which could be an hour and a half or two hours. And then they'll switch and do the alternative activity. So if you're Zodiac cruising, you'll make your way to shore and then experience shore. And vice versa, if you're on land first, you'll go Zodiac cruising second. So everyone will be getting off the ship at the same time. It's just you, you'll be starting off with different activities, but um, unless somebody chooses to stay back on the ship, everyone will be getting disembarking the ship. And like Franny said, it gets split. Um, a typical day, you'll have breakfast, you'll go out for a few hours. You're gonna come back to the ship, you'll have some lunch, then you'll go out again for a few hours, you'll come back, there's a recap session. Once a recap session is done, um, the expedition leader will tell us what the plans are for the following day, we'll have some dinner, and then we'll carry on either bar talk or it's your free time. But for the excursions, it is it is um, set in a way that uh, everyone will be in an activity. And if somebody signed up for kayaking or the paddling program, um, a small group of like those passengers will also go off to do um, their excursions. Awesome. Okay. I know we're cognizant of time, so I'm just going to ask two more questions and then anything that we don't get to, we will answer individually in emails. Um, one, the second last question would be, um, can you talk about the fitness level um, and mobility that guests would need? Do you want me to take this? Yes, thank you. Um, so you need to be independent. You need to be able to walk around the ship and go up and down the stairs independently um, without uh, any assistance. That's, that's gonna be one of the requirements. But in terms of, do I have to be super fit to go on these expeditions? The way it works in Antarctica, there are perimeters that are set and you get to customize how you want to spend your time. So if people want to go for the, an extended uh, walk, you know, in the areas that are, are, are designated for us to go to, then the, those people can go off to do that. If somebody wants to, some, sometimes people are into photography or sometimes they're looking to just spend time with, you know, looking, just watching the penguins or taking in the landscape. So you, each person gets to decide what they want to do. I had the same similar type of fears when I had gone because I'm not the most fit or the um, the skinniest person out there. Um, I am what I call a plus size model, and I, um, you know, went out and I decided how I wanted to spend my time. And I was also a part of a very encouraging group of passengers as well as expedition team members that where I wanted to extend myself. I mean, uh, I did. Uh, uh, I went and on Nico Harbor, one of the continental landings, there was a section where you can climb up to a very top point. And um, from the bottom, I had already decided I'm not going to do it because in my uh, animated vision that I was getting, I was going to be this 
brown skinned person in a very in a very bright yellow parka coming down a hill and looking at the penguins like their pins at a bowling ball alley and that was me just taking them all out um but thankfully nothing like that happened one step forward and i made it to the very top had the most incredible view but in terms of fitness um yes independently getting around the ship but at the same time um it is it it is a welcoming environment for many people great Thank you. Um, and one last question for now uh, to end off the evening, which was the first question that came in. Do you, both of you have books that you can recommend to read prior to leaving, reading uh, prior to the trip? Yes, I would recommend, oh my gosh, I would recommend reading the book Endurance. It's, a, it's the Shackleton adventure. And it's a, it's a great tale. It's a wild tale of leadership and exploration um so that's that's a that could be great and it could be a good idea to perhaps watch even watch some of the David Attenborough stuff to kind of familiarize yourself with the natural behaviors of the animals you already have like a kind of a background in um in it you could also watch On Thin Ice. It's a documentary. You can find it online. It's, I believe, from Yale University about climate change and climate crisis in Antarctica. And you can, what else can you read? Rocky, do you have any books? Oh, there's, <laughs> there's a, yeah, go ahead. Excuse me. There's a really great book on Amundsen. The title is Escaping Me. Maybe I can post, I can post some book recommendations on Facebook in the coming days as well. Yeah. And I know that with like on Quark's website, we do have a polar learning channel that has um, a lot of great videos of um, guests, of lecturers, as well as expedition staff members. Um, but there's also recommendations of um, books that one could read. Um, so if you wanted to check out the polar library there's lots of good information there as well great thank you um that just about wraps up the question period because we are over time um franny do you have any uh would you like to continue on and uh, just uh, wrap up for yeah i just would like to say um even though we're wrapping up here the conversation is an ending and we welcome phone calls and emails and uh, anybody who has unanswered questions, we're gonna be getting to um, them and we'll respond very shortly to you. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna change the slide here. Okay, um, so just wanted to let everyone know that the next webinar that we will be speaking to is about Morocco and that will happen on November 30th. So if you haven't already, we'd encourage you to sign up. Otherwise, um, for any next slide, if you could, as we are wrapping up again to reiterate, if you have any other additional questions that um, you have, you can think of um, that you haven't put into the chat box, please feel free to email us or call us. Um, otherwise, we just want to thank everyone for their time tonight. I know we went over time. Apologies, but there was a lot of great information. I hope everyone is inspired um, to think about Antarctica if you have not already done so. Um, and thank you to Franny and Rocky for joining us and hope everyone has a great evening. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.